clients, I guess the word client, company owners, because I don't have that many, they fall in love with their own idea, but they also are in love with making money. If I can fool these stupid customers into buying my stupid thing, then I will have a Lambo and a yacht. And they're not focused on if I could solve this problem in the world really well for somebody, they would share that with other people. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Perfectly Mentored. I'm your host, Jason Portnoy. On this episode, I welcome back my good friend, Ron Lynch, one of the smartest marketing people on the planet, uh, just uh, truly gets the fundamentals on how to really uh, get marketing to work and drive sales and drive building a brand and building a business the right way. Uh, someone I'm totally aligned with when it comes to business fundamentals, uh, mindset, uh, just we talk money, we talk marketing, we talk investing, we talk how to grow a business and everything you need in order to do it the right way. You're not going to want to miss this one. Check it out. Ron, welcome back. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks a lot, Jason. Thanks for having me. Uh, always. I mean, I'm super excited for this because for people who who may not know you, I mean, you're you're the real deal, especially in the market, especially in the marketing space and and just a really good person and someone that as I was coming up in the space, I was fortunate to meet you on on like my way up. I'm nowhere near the top, but still on the way up. But like the sure, early sure. stages of, of up, uh, I was able to meet you and and just form a bond with you. I just everything you stand for, I'm I'm with. And just one of the smartest people I know when it comes to when it comes to this industry. So I'm super excited to have you back here and just even just to catch up with a friend. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And we haven't talked for a while. I'm 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 honored to be on. You so, you do good work in the world and you help a lot of people. That's thank you. I, I, tr I try and 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 so do you. So I think we have that mutual connection. Um I want to just jump into here something we started talking about offline. Sure. You've been involved, I mean, in the marketing space for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. Actually, Three I years. mean, yeah, yeah a, few, a couple of years. If, if, you could, <laughs> if you could just give a little bit of a recap on, on your marketing and business career up until now. I know, it's, I know it's long and people could go back and listen to the first episode where you were on and talked about it. But just, just I want to provide some context here. So if you could give just that quick recap, um, we'll, we could kind of jump into things. Sure. So in a nutshell, I started out pretty in my early 20s. I worked in a retail grocery store. So I learned retail operations. I was fortunate enough to get selected to be in a movie. Um, so I went to an audition of a friend of mine. I crashed an audition. I ended up in the movie business. And subsequently, I was in about a dozen movies in the Pacific Northwest, had a SAG card. That allowed me to meet a lot of movie stars, a lot of directors, gave me a passion for uh, writing screenplays, which I never thought I was a writer in my life. Like I just didn't think I wanted to do that. Found out I loved it. Um, got rewarded for it. Stayed in the grocery business, worked my way up to be a director of retail operations for a, a grocery company. Um, did some turnarounds, did some new store construction things to build fancy grocery stores. And then I, uh, one of my clients in one of my stores was launching the George Foreman grill and, uh, we had a cooking kiosk in one of our stores and I let him come in and shoot uh, man on the street demos and met George Foreman's agent um, optioned a movie to him um, that, that turned into me leaving the grocery industry and going to work for a direct response agency that was um, we were launching, you know, orange glow with Billy Mays and uh, OxyClean and uh for, for the youngsters, for the, for the youngsters listening, those are the OGs in, in the in the infomercial space. Yeah, yeah, I think I think most people know who Billy Mays is. is still has some re some remembrance of OxyCleaner, the 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 yell and sell of the bearded one. Um, and uh, now I've spent you know 20, 20 years and plus doing writing, creating uh, content, um, investing in products, finding products. I've worked at at the helm of a consumer goods company, discovering products and licensing them. I own a bunch of patents myself that I created. Um, so kind of a broad background, um, but all fundamentally, the, the intersection is three things, writing and creative, understanding of P&L and business mechanics, and understanding the process of filmmaking. So those three things together are kind of what, what is contained in here. And 30 years of experience of some mishmash of that. Which is, which is great because we were talking about this offline. I think 
people who started in marketing 10 years ago, maybe have more of an appreciation for what you're saying right now. People who started five years ago in the marketing space are starting to are starting to feel that they're going to need an appreciation for what you're saying right now. And what I mean by that is Facebook, direct response marketing, social media advertising has made it very easy in the last five years. Talk about pre-iOS, where you could put a dollar in and get three, five dollars, three to five dollars back. And that was the quant. That was the that was what you were looking at from your marketing efforts. It wasn't brand building, it wasn't real marketing, it was just direct response, it was transactional, selling to the max. The problem is you didn't really need any marketing fundamentals. You didn't really need to write great creative. You really didn't need solid, solid copy. You could just put things out there and try many things and hope they stick. Now in the post iOS world, in a cookie world, in a time where we're inundated with more and more ads and more and more direct response and cost of advertising going up, what gets rewarded in the algorithm? Creative and copy. Now more than ever, you actually have to be a marketer. So Walk me through, I, I know it's kind of been, I know you've always drilled down on those fundamentals. And I think, sure, I, like I told you, that's, I think part of my success has been that I understood the fundamentals and I wasn't the most technical media buyer. But how do you see that that transition from like the 10 years ago to the five years ago, and then what we're seeing now and what we're about to see? I guess, think of it like a casino. When casinos first started, they were mechanized devices and games and cards. And the casinos discovered that they had to, to become more profitable and compete with the other casinos. They, you couldn't play blackjack with a deck of cards. You had to deal out of a six card shoe. Your uh, um, slot machines had to be weighted. Now they're digital. You, they added one zero, then two zeros to the roulette table. They started to create complexity that favored the house. And if you look at it, um, in a lot of ways, the media companies are the house and you're going in with a pile of chips trying to produce a larger pile of chips. Um, so first of all, I, I want to slant some things. Um, I want to walk in with a great product because it costs me more money to an effort to market a poor product or market something just for the sake of making money. Like if you've been through my course, you know, I don't teach people how to get rich. I teach people how to how to build wealth, which is a completely different thing. And, and we that's why I kind of laugh a little bit at the Lambo culture of internet marketing is it's a yeah, there's a lot of money to be made and these people all spend it. They don't have any, they don't come from parents or families or, 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 or rent or rent wealth. or rent it. Yes, or rent it. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of fake it till you make it. And I just don't believe in any of those principles because to do it correctly. Is actually easier. Uh, so teaching people that wealth is found in providing really quality goods to other people and services and, and solving real problems in the world is useful because if you pick correctly, eventually what a brand is, a brand is when, and, and really marketing is starting the conversation around brand, a really great brand is when your customers become your advertising channel. When they start sh sharing your pro their product, your product with the rest of the world, that makes your advertising costs plummet. Now, if you've done a good job of establishing a price point, that what you, you used to spend on advertising, you now have in wealth and you can expand and create more things in the world. And wealth is not a pile of cash. Wealth is a pile of assets. And that that is not understood very easily by young people. They think it's a pile of money. Um, a pile of money is something that's very easy to burn through, but it's actually difficult to burn through a pile of assets. So, um, if you're smart and you, you you're prudent with them, so that that's kind of at the core of it to me is learning how to control your mind, learn how to have empathy for the customer, find a product that serves a number of customers then have a number of conversations individually with each category of customer and then deliver, over deliver on that promise. Um, so a lot of times I, I pick things that are fairly complicated to sell. And so the, that's why probably why I favor the long form material is I like to walk somebody into an education because hmm. if in 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 40 minutes, 
you really let me educate you in a documentarian fashion and give you some scientific examples and really proofs. And you talk to people who've tried the product, so to speak. You got them. You've got, you've not only got a product that you sold to a person, you now have an educated consumer who knows how to go out and talk about it to their friends and family after they've bought it. The problem with brands listening right, right now is that it costs more money to educate than it does to just try to sell. But what people don't realize is, is not really maybe it doesn't at all yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saying i'm yeah. saying maybe from the up cost you're looking at it but but if you have to go sell and you have to try 10 million ads in order to get that ad to sell it costs you more money than it did to just do it right the first time around you know it's interesting that's what that's why i, I do a lot of video work online that i guess you'd call our vsls and they run from five minutes to 40 minutes uh but they're compelling and obviously, I know the patterns of opening loops and pre presenting evidence like it's a trial, but it doesn't cost me anything to write those because it comes out of my head. I do the research and then I write. I'm like, people will approach me with a product. And if the product's great, I'll take an equity stake in the co company and say, yeah, don't pay me. I don't need the cash. I, I'm more interested in the success of this. And I'll develop the VSL or the infomercial for it. And then it's actually the lead ads that funnel into that. It's the, whether it's, you know, some version of clickbait or, or interest to, to spark somebody, the pattern interrupt to get them to jump into that. But, you know, we built our chair company with, I think the Kickstarter budget, total budget was $30,000. Hmm. Then we went online and it was a kill what you eat environment. And that was the technique that I used. I used a very short VSL and ads and we got to a million dollars a month and then we got celebrities and they became nobody bought from the celebrities but they'd click so they'd see cindy crawford or bruce willis or you know Shaq in an ad and they'd click on that and take them to the vsl they'd get educated and they'd buy the product and we turned that into a multi-million dollar business completely organically and refeeding dollars into the system that we earned. We earned every single media dollar in that. We didn't have investors going, oh, here's $500,000 to spend on ads. Well, it didn't happen that way. So it's completely doable. I mean, I don't remember seeing a Twitter ad before Twitter launched or a Facebook ad before Facebook launched. Like there's products in the world that you, if you have a great solution and you are a creative, compelling person, Absolutely no reason in the world you can't just absolutely kill it in this industry. Yeah, I mean, and I say this all the time, like everyone complains about algorithm changes or the platform changes. And I used to say like, you go back and bring David Ogilvy, for example, into today's world and give him the tools right now. You think he cares one iota about iOS changes? He's like, what do you mean? I could put this out there and I could literally just target anyone that I want and I could just put my offer out there. I'll take that. Yeah, and that's and, how and I, can, I, mean, and I can I'm almost as old as Ogilvy, and he's been dead for 50 years. But no, that's yeah. you know, it's this. I have the same kind of mind that like Ogilvy is one of my heroes. Like this is this is the way that you should think. And if you stop and do the thinking and do a proper creative and strategic brief up front, then you have a long form document that you can go back and you can get short ads out of that. You can get a zillion hooks if you've thought it through. But unfortunately, people get trapped, and I understand how they get trapped, in needing to pay their rent next month, and they're out going, hey, for $3,000, I can give you this. And they're like, they don't even know what the product is. They're just asking people for money in exchange for doing their advertising. It's like, well, that's not a very uh, good yeah, model. Uh, look, there's, there's a lot of bad agencies out there, and I know a lot of them. There's a lot of good agencies, and I know a lot of them. Um, but part of the responsibility has to be put on the business owner too because the business owner wouldn't fall for that like for example i wouldn't fall for that of hey three thousand i'll make you four thousand tomorrow like that's not interesting to me i want to build something for longevity i want to build something big here if you become short-sighted that's on you a little bit and i think that's where i mean there has to on be everybody. some responsibility taken by the by clients on this that that have constantly been burned. There has to be some responsibility they have to take in this situation. Yeah, I, m many clients, I guess the word client, company owners, because I don't have that many, are 
they fall in love with their own idea, but they also are in love with making money. Hmm. If I can fool these stupid customers into buying my stupid thing, then I will have a Lambo and a yacht. And they're not focused on if I could solve this problem in the world really well for somebody, they would share that with other people. So I don't disseminate the business owner from the agency owner. It's ownership. Yep. It's ownership of yourself, of your integrity, of the idea or product you're working on. So I don't work on stuff I know won't work. I don't, I don't work on stuff that I know is suspicious or nefarious, like nothing. I just say no. Yep. And I come to the process for myself with a prove it kind of mind. The customer has to kind of like the client has to prove their thing works. And I charge them to, to prove it to me. Like you, I don't just like, you don't just hire me. Yeah. You hire me and I come into your pro your project for a day and I work with you for a day. And then at the end of that day, we both decide whether we're going to take the next step. But I'm going to poke a bunch of holes in what you, you're doing and I'm going to reframe the way that you're selling. And again, if you agree with me, we're going to move forward because I do know how to sell things ethically. And most people don't. They just don't think that they need to sell things ethically. They think they need to trick people into buying shit. It's, it also goes, you, you said something earlier about you want to create something that, that people are going to want to spread themselves. I, Seth Godin calls it sneezers, right? So like, for example, you sneeze on me, now I'm infested. Then I like, you know, one sneeze goes down and it's like a virus. You touch one person, touches two people, three people. They don't think like that. They think single transaction. How many single transactions can I get versus how do I make the experience? Like, and that's where I think people spend so much time on advertising towards getting new customers and not enough time making sure your experience with your existing customers are doing well, because those are the people that are going to spread your, your message. Those are the, the, the converted. Those are the, the you know, your zealots. Exactly. Like those are the people that are going to spread the name of, of, of the Lord around for you. So, I mean. I, I think part of it comes down to, which again, you said in the beginning, you had a, you had a few things that, that you look for when it comes to advertising. And one of them, most people don't even include in there, the, you know, the margins, the, the, the profit, the, 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 the P and L and, and those are the important parts in there. I just think business owners don't have business fundamentals in the last five years. They just think I could just throw everything out there and hope that I make money. And then when their advertising isn't working, but their operating expense represents 75% of their revenue, there's problems. Like, so how far do you take your, your marketing towards the actual business fundamentals themselves? I, so I, you, as you know, I, I teach this course, but I typically in the first day of meeting my clients, walk them through the first day or two of the course to get them to answer the questions. The, no one ever answers these questions correctly unless they've been through my course. So, I, or I've seen me speak or heard me on a podcast. So I'll have someone come in. I'll say there's four absolute fundamental things that every business needs to be, needs to have to be a long-term success as a brand. What are the four things? And people go product, 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 product. We got innovation, this, that, 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 that. And they just talk about all the, all the features of their stuff. Oh, and it's got to, it's got to have a, a margin. Hmm. Those that's fair, but the four things have never changed in the history of the world, nor will they ever change. And you have to understand what they are. One is yes, you need to have an innovation. Even if you're selling a commodity, if you can pr present an innovation in the commoditized world, it becomes an innovation. So there, there were phones. People bought phones forever. Then there were cordless phones. Everybody threw out their corded phone and bought a cordless phone. Then, and then, and then Steve phones. Jobs jumped on stage and went like that. Yeah. So you can see that's the, so they, they were commoditized and then they became innovative, then became commoditized again. Now iPhones, you know, have one in America, Androids, every place else. So innovation does matter. The second is audience. Does somebody want it? And that's often missed. 
People will sign up to do a business that nobody actually wants. And they, their ego is tied to the innovation and like, they don't see that nobody wants the product. Um, ideally, your audience is subdividable. So if you just look at cell phones, for instance, I can immediately think of four categories of people that need a cell phone. A business owner, because he needs to be in contact with the world and he wants to travel or she wants to travel. Uh, a parent, so they can contact their home, be in contact with. A child, I want my kid to have a cell phone so that I can reach them because it's a matter of safety. And then my parent, I want seniors to have them so they can be reached. Now, you, then there's the, all the other reasons, the myriad of, of public reasons, but those are very definable, targetable audiences. And, emo and uh, elicit emotional response. Exactly. I can start to start to get to the, the, the fourth thing, which I'll get to in a minute, but we'll get the third one first. The third is margin. Because if you don't have margin in your product, you won't have the advertising dollars to advertise your product. You, and you need the research dollars to re-innovate your innovation. So you have to come up with a product that typically has a 70 to 80% margin in it. Because, and the reason I said people tell me all the time, like 80%, that's insane, Ron. Well, it's actually not insane because if you don't really have a lot of money to get into the advertising world, you are going to initially spend about 30 to 40% of your earned revenue back in marketing to build a brand. Then you have your business expenses, the cost of goods, all of the things that go into that. So why do I like the 80% number? Because as the company scales, you become efficient as a management organization. So what used to be 40% cost as a management organization will drop to about 10%, hopefully. Then your marketing costs will start to come down as your sales increase, but then you'll hit retail. And when you take your product to retail, 50% of the money is gone. It goes to the distributor and the retailer. It's gone. That's not even your advertising money. A lot of these companies, you have a product that you're selling for $200. You're building it for $50, I hope. Because when you go to sell it at Walmart, Kmart, Costco, wherever you go in the retail world, they're only going to pay 100 bucks. And they're going to still expect you to actually increase your advertising because they have now bought the SKUs. Not, not to mention all the chargebacks they're going to give her because their box came in the wrong way, wasn't labeled properly. Or, yeah, or, or Colts who's going to discount you and discount you and discount you, right? Yeah. Because they're actually the Salvation Army of retailers. <laughs> so um, then the fourth thing is story. And that's what you bring. As a business owner, as a marketer, how we tell the story to those people because we don't have customers. We have salespeople in training. Our customers are salespeople in training. So you must treat them like they work for you in all the best ways. You have to be kind to them because you want them to talk nice about the company. You have to make sure they have a great training. That's your sales pitch. You make sure that you have a great relationship with them long-term. That's your HR with them. And they go and build your brand for you. Those are I the mean, four things. And if you, there's, there's never been a fifth thing that I found. And I've never been able to cut one of those things out. I, th I think the hard part is when, when people, it is for people crafting that offer, that initial offer in the first place of, you know, we just see so many different things out there. And we turn on our phone, we get we have a million different blasts that sometimes it's hard for us as business owners. And I remember this when I had my clothing business at times, it was like, what is, what's my differentiating factor? So that's your innovation, right? Because if you're a commodity, you still find ways to differentiate yourself. How do I, how do I, you know, like, so you have brands that are selling $180 t-shirts or, you know, a, a, a local plumber. The, the hard part is, is crafting that offer or, or, or figuring out that US, that, that USP. So yeah, that USP is, is this, it's the story. That's the story piece of your innovation. So, right? so what, so, so, so walk me through, like, if someone's listening here right now, is like, man, I, I, I sell pants. Like, I mean, there's no real story to that. There's no, like, there's a million other of my competitors that do this, you know, like what, what's, what's, 
what's their process to figuring out, okay, how do I stand out? How do I, how am I different? Okay. So like I said, at the top, it's differentiators. You're describing a commodity and you're asking me how to make a commodity different. I don't know how to make commodity different. That's so that, that's why I say, look at these four things. You might be in the wrong business hmm. because if you don't have an innovation, it's going to be very, very difficult for you. Now, how do you create one? I'll give you a very specific example of a company that we helped a year ago and they were doing well, but I bet you you've probably never heard of the company, but they're now valued at over a billion dollars and they're a consumer goods company. A billion dollars is pretty good valuation for a consumer goods company. So the company's called Circle and they sell a water bottle, just like a Nalgene bottle, sexy shape, and it's got cartridges, flavor cartridges that poke into the top. And as you draw water through the cartridge, it releases a, a concentrated Ooh. flavor into the water. So what used to be an eight pack of Gatorade is now one empty bottle with a flavor pack in it and you can fill it eight times. The challenge being is they were operating under three different brand names because they, were, they had a, a line for coffee, they had a line for athletics, they had a line that duplicated, uh, I'll say sweet flavors of like Kool-Aid type soda pop type things. So they had these three different things that they were calling it. So they were spreading their marketing dollars out there competing with themselves, struggling. But their product did 50 things. And if you've ever been through the airport in TSA, you instantly know the value of this product. I carry an empty water bottle through, and then they have that water thing dispenser in the airport. And suddenly I got eight bottles of Gatorade. Like there's, there's one audience right there that I know I can sell to. So we started walking through their audiences, condensed to their name and said, the problem that you're having is in all of our conversations, you guys are talking about how we're as good as Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts coffee or Gatorade or Powerade or Coke, Pepsi, all, all of them. They had a flavor for everything. I said, you're getting into the flavor wars and you're going to lose a flavor war with Pepsi. What we all know intrinsically that nobody has ever really said to us is that water sucks. It's boring. Mm -hmm but you know you should be drinking more of it. Every piece of nutritional content in the world, everybody who sells a diet, fitness, whatever, says drink more water. So I simply said, finally, water is your favorite beverage. That became the tagline of the company. We only sold it under the name Circle. And now there was this rotisserie of flavors of why is water my favorite be beverage? Because you can make it taste like whatever you want in an eight pack in this little thing for two bucks. <laughs> what do you like? We'll send you five flavors. Boom. We took something very simple and hung our hat on it. So when it comes to a pair of pants, I don't know. See, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because like, you know, Jay Abraham was, was on and we were, and we were chatting about this a little bit during, during the show and more offline is that, you consult with a lot of businesses. I, I consult for a lot of different businesses. He consults and he's the billion dollar man. And we all say the same thing. Uh, business owners overcomplicate business, right? The, the truth is business could actually be quite simple. And it's the problem that it's so simple at times that we sit there and say, no, 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 it can't just be like that. And then we overcomplicate things. And that's when we have complicated business models of eight different audiences, eight different names for our product and, and whatnot. When it, when simplicity matters most, do you find that that's the case with a lot of business owners you consult with is that they just overcomplicate things? Uh, I, I'm, this is going to sound facetious when I say it, but I tell people this and I mean it. I'm as dumb as your dumbest customer. That's mm -hmm. why you hire me. The world is full of people and the IQs range from about 70 to 130. Most people are in the 85 to 115, like 90% of people, 95% of people, something like that. So most people are kind of in the middle of the road, but half of all people have an IQ under a hundred. And if we don't get them, we're not getting the market. So I believe in talking simply and matter of factly and asking very simple questions to the audience because the mind cannot not answer a question. If I ask you a question, what city did you grow up in? So you're compelled to tell me. 
your mind is like, uh, gotta get it out. Doesn't matter what the question is. If you ask somebody a question, their brain out of survival wants to answer the question. So to me, marketing is asking two or three very simple questions that stack and add up to purchase my product as the result. It's, it's, it's like trial lawyers lead, lead, leading them there. Always. It is, it's a form of practicing law. I think one of the best marketing books, and it's not even a marketing book I ever read, was, was by Jerry Spence, like the famous trial lawyer, how to win, how to win an argument. Like that, it's all storytelling. It's all leading, leading them to sell. Like, and it's sales, right? You don't want to have to jump on a sales call where you have to convince. You want someone else to sell themselves. And that's when you know you're going to close the sale. A half hour infomercial or a long form VSL sales letter, David Ogilvy long copy is a trial. There's 12 jurors in the box and you're going to explain the problem that each one of those 12 jurors has. Then you're going to tell each one of those jurors what you're going to tell them that there's going to be an innovation that's going to amaze them. And they're going to come to this conclusion, whether they like it or not, because the facts are the facts. Then you're going to talk, go through your proofs, go through your experiments, your examples, your evidence. And then you remind them the end, just a call to action. All right. I'm right. Here's my offer. Short form advertising is taking one of those problems, one of those jurors and one of those solutions and locking them in a corner in a short form. How important is, I mean, people spend a lot of time now, like we have clients that say targeting, targeting, you're targeting, you're targeting. And I sit there and say, no, 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 no. You're focused on the wrong thing. It's, it's what you say more than, more than the target. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I'll give you another case study, if you don't mind. Of course. I think that, the, I think that what you say finds the target. I, I not only finds, what you, finds the target, but also qualifies and disqualifies them. Okay. So do we have this, these friends that have a gardenia company. Uh, it's called High Camp Supply, and they sell very exotic, expensive gifts. An order of flowers is $300 to $700. The flowers last for five days and then they die. Right. This is an expense. This is a literally an ephemeral luxury product. It's here for a minute and it's gone. So I did not know how to sell this product. And we have a site that we call the Swiss Trust, where I advertise and test things like our chair, friends' products, or whatever. So this person's a friend of mine. I said, I'm going to write a long form Facebook post and then we'll just boost the post. So I wrote this story about where these gardenias come from, the cultivation, but really the story was more about, would you like to give, would you like to be known as the best gift giver in your circle? Hmm. Gift givers who are remembered get socially elevated above everybody else and they never get forgotten. In fact, they're considered prettier, richer, kinder, and more fun to be with. Whether you like it or not, that's the science of how we feel about people who give great gifts. So here's a gift that you can give. I'm going to describe the gift. So when you give this gift, though, before you do, I want you to write this note and include it with the gift. So these bean gardenias are very fragrant. They're fragrant. They smell like Hawaii, you know, this like really bold, sweet, lovely smell. So, okay, order the gift and then on the card, write, Dear blank, dear Claire, Bill and I absolutely love you. But before you open this box, I want you to pause and I want you to think about how powerful, how beautiful, how intelligent, and how much fun you are to be with. You've actually made a massive difference in our lives. So go ahead and open this. And when you smell this fragrance, every time you visit Hawaii or Mexico or someplace tropical, You'll smell this again, and I want you to remember how much we love you and how awesome you are. Hmm. Okay, so that's the note. Okay, if you're curious about this, you can go see their selection of gifts. Here's the URL, and here's $20 off or $50 off through Swiss Trust. We put, I think I put $100 behind boosting that post. Gal calls me four days later. What did you do? Like, what do you mean? What did I do? She goes, I got $62,000 worth of orders I'm sitting on. 
who did you target? I said, well, I didn't know who to target. So I just went in and targeted people who could afford it because this is a ridiculously expensive product. I picked the one top 1% on Facebook, just the richest households. She goes, well, we've got these orders. I said, I'll be right back. I need to go figure out what's going on here. So I dug into the orders. Guess who was buying the product? From the daughters. Yeah. Daughters. It was the, I targeted the zip codes in the houses of the top richest people in the United States, the but it was their 19, 20 year old daughters because they were inside the house. Their IP addresses were in, attached to their parents and they have abundant credit cards that their parents give them with no limits and they can do whatever the hell they want. Spoiled girls. Yep. And they were, because I told them how to do this, they were gifting it to each other so they would do open box videos on Instagram and get the social credit in their peer group for being cool. Wow. I am not smart enough to have figured that out. The messaging figured it out. I took two things. I messaged as high value as I could, told them exactly what to do with it in the most creative way I thought possible. And then I just targeted the place where I thought, I pinged the fish where I thought the fish lived. Got a whole school of fish I didn't even know existed. What, how valuable was that piece of that? Because that's research. That's just not yeah. marketing. Well, how valuable is that to the company going forward? I mean, incredible. So, I mean, So I, I think you I think you touched on on a couple of things there. I'm just trying to figure, figure out which way I want to take it. But there's one thing to craft the offer. There's another thing to analyze and and read read the story that the data gives you, right? Because the data alone is just data. The analytics alone are just analytics. But there's a story that that the data is telling you. How important is that marriage of crafting an offer? And then reading, and then and then be able to tell that story after. So, I think that I think we all have two lobes to our brain. I don't think that I am this. I am unique in this way at all. I think that most people don't exercise both lobes of their brain. So, what I'll tell you is, exercising both lobes of my brain. There's a creative side that understands how to passionately tell that story and move somebody and get them to step in. But there's also a Vulcan side to my brain. I got Kirk over on one side and Spock on the other side that goes in and goes, there, there's a story in that data. Let's harness that because it's efficiency at that point. And if I don't, if I don't utilize my mind to, in both ways, I'm not efficient. So really what you're describing is efficiency. It's not that there's a right way, like, oh, it's this or it's that. No, it's a blend of the two that builds the efficiency because all human beings have a rational side and a data side. But most of us move from our emotional center. We purchase from our emotional center. We, we do, but I feel like business owners today in today's landscape, and especially agency owners and media buyers and marketers today are very data-driven. They're, they're very on that one side and they don't look at the storytelling because, and it may not be the fault of necessarily the agency owner or, or, the, or the media buyer, let's say, of because they may feel pressure of, hey, what's the data on this? How many sales did this bring in? How many did that? And they may want to force it. And I think that's client selection. I think that's a whole different story. But then you also have the business owners who, who don't understand that I need to invest to figure out that message. I need to figure out what the right message is. I need to read that story in there, that there's story in the data and not just, man, a 0.7x return on ad spend. That's a failure. You're fired. Yeah. And I think that, so there's obviously that, again, that's the left and the right brain. And there's the responsibility between the agency owner and the product owner. That's why I have these discussions up front. Now, when I describe the results of the flower results, what did I say that I did? I said it was an experiment. Yep. These are all experiments. So you need to go in. Both, both parties need to come into this conversation saying, we're going to do some experiments together. So oh, one I, experiment. I, I, think, I think that's one of the reasons. I think I could have, you know, in hindsight, built a way bigger agency. But I decided to, 
I, I'm like a sales killer because I try to go in and, and kill the sales and try to make sure that you understand what it's going to take to actually build this brand and not just $1 and $5 back, right? And so some people sit there and say, thank you. But the other agency told me that th they're, they're less expensive than you and they're guaranteeing me this amount. I'm like, go, please, and go get it in writing and then go try it out. Yeah, and then come back when you're done because yeah. I don't doubt that they can do that in a very short cycle. Yeah. So my technique, I guess, my belief is that one, I only pick stuff I believe in and two, I have that conversation. That's why I go in for a day and I charge them to go in for a day for anywhere from five to $25,000, sometimes two days and pull the whole product apart, the audiences, the data, the emotional content and everything. Usually what I find is the company has no idea what they're selling to who at the end of the day. Because if you're a brand, you're selling an identity to a customer. You're not selling a widget. You're selling them who they are, if you're a brand. Because yep. people adopt brands to reflect their own identity. I want to shift gears for a second because uh, our time's coming to an end. I, one of the things that you and I have chatted more offline about and, and in person, and one of the things I've always been you know, that interested in is, is the way you view money your psychology around money and your money mindset. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think part of my success has always, has been shifting that mindset and learning the real, the real, the real mindset. I think that's a big holdback for entrepreneurs. So I want you to just talk about money for, for a minute. And sure. what's the biggest holdup that you see for entrepreneurs or people talking? What's the biggest money mistake that or money mindset mistake that they're making right now and and how do you and what's what's the solution in your mind how should people be thinking about money money is a byproduct resource most people if you ask them what money is they'll say well money is freedom or money is um what do you say? A force multiplier, or you say you hear people say, "Oh, money! If the more money you get, the more it shows who someone really is." Um, money is evil, money, or money security. Yeah, I say yeah, or money is uh, the root of all evil, or the love of it's the root of all evil, or and and you ask them what money is not, and they'll say, "Well, money's not a god, and money's not the most important thing, and money isn't everything." And in all of those answers, you're telling me why you don't have any. <laughs> Because the fact of the matter is money is not optional. That's the only thing it's not. In this world, in order to pay your rent, and your car bill, fill it with gas and fill your belly, money's not optional. It's our system. That's just the truth about it. And the fact that it's not optional makes you go back to money is and chase the heck out of it. People chase money. Money does not come to you from being chased. If you've ever chased a balloon or a feather in your house, you realize that as you chase it, your body's creating a wind that's pushing it away from you. It's not any different than that with money. Money is created when you produce so much value for somebody else, they cannot help but give you money because they don't know what else to give you. And I will tell you this, uh, I'm not going to give you the numbers because these things are recorded and go publicly. But I have found ways of having people give me things other than money that are extremely valuable. And they hand me things that are more valuable than money, than the cash value of them, without even thinking twice because they don't attach a dollar figure to them. So I'm much more interested in having wealth than getting rich. And in, in your wealth, mind, what's the difference? I, like, let, let's take you and down. Like, yeah, Just yeah. Because that is important. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I think that's important. No, no, interrupt me anytime. Rich is a need to show other people that you have money. Wealth is having money without the need to show it to anybody. The wealthiest people I know are not on the Forbes list. They are above the Forbes list. They don't appear on the Forbes list. They're that wealthy. The Forbes list is kind of like People Magazine. There are people that do not appear on that list because they have more money than the people on that list. Hmm. 
they own golf courses, like massive golf courses and corporations like that. They own yachting companies as a sideline. They have institutional wealth in their families, and yet they go to Burger King. They're not, they don't sit in the cor- at the corner table at the steakhouse and buy bottles of Dom. They don't have luxury boxes. Their friends do. That's, so, st- I look at riches as a form of public insecurity. I desperately need to show people how rich I am because I feel that insecure. The, well, the wealthy people do not do that. They stay out of the public eye. And as time goes by for me, I'm trying to retreat from the public eye more and more and more. Like, I don't live in a flashy house. I live in a tiny little house in the ranch in the middle of nowhere. I mean, if you can find me in that picture, you can find me. Hmm. Like, that's my address somewhere in the, out there. That's, though, that's, and I'm not claiming to be incredibly wealthy and off that list. I'm, I'm not. But, I, I, but I've learned something. And it is that the flash that, that people look for in being rich creates anger in other people, jealousy, backstabbing. Um, and so I'm, I, I think being private about building wealth and having people love you for who you are, not what you have, that's the number one problem. You know, I obviously have run into a lot of celebrities and work with a lot of rich and famous people. Number one problem they have is they can't find relationships in their life. They don't know what's they real. Get there. They don't know what's real. And then the people, the people around them love them for what they've got and who they like. There's it creates all of these insane complications that um yeah, I've I've worked with so many athletes when, when I have the clothing and that's and once you get in, once you're friends with one, it becomes like a fraternity, like they all vouch for you, but they have a very close garden because like everyone just wants access because of they want something from them or because it's cool or whatnot. Yeah, it's because they're insecure and then they want to step up or they. So the number one way to build wealth is to provide something that serves another person so well, they're so happy with it, they share it with another person. And you can own the company and nobody knows it. It just grows. I think that I have a slice of 72 companies now I sit on the board for four or five companies that are building and growing. Um, I've invested in a number of companies where I, I do the marketing for them because I believe in them. But I don't. If you see me on Facebook, I'm showing pictures of my dog and my wife and my spaghetti. And it's not. Yeah. I don't show behind the scenes because it's none of your business. And if you if you if you have the self confidence to live that way, guess what happens? You become very centered and grounded and heavy, just like a bowling ball on a big rubber mat. And stuff comes to you really quietly. Stuff comes to you. People figure you out, and they're like, "Okay, this guy's got his shit together. Let's let's see if he he'll work with us." The best deals come. The best relationships. Sometimes they're business. Sometimes they're not. But I'm also Funny, in a position I, to see now. I look at the internet marketing space and I look at when I started and I looked at like all these people I used to look up to and where they are right now. And they're either out of business, they're doing something completely different. They've, they've, they've moved on. And it's just like, it's one of those things of like that I've always been so cautious of, which was, was my reputation and guarding it like forever and just being like, like uh, everyone laughs. I, th- I think the hardest part, if you're in marketing, if you're in services, is not closing the deal. The hardest part begins after the contract signed and delivering on what on what you could do because it's a partnership. You may not, you, you may not be able to, you, you may be able to, but like, I think that's the part that keeps me up at night. Um, and I think you're right. I think people need to be a little bit more grounded. Um, I'll end with with this. Like, so what's your, how should people, we were, we, we took, I took you down a rabbit hole for a second, but how should people start thinking about money in order, in order to attract more of it? Um, it's where you put it. Money is, it's a byproduct resource. It's a seed. 
It's not a plant. So if you consume it like a plant, you won't have any. If you plant it like a seed, it will grow. Some things bloom, some things don't bloom. But to me, it's a byproduct resource. I, I get my personal finances well within my expenditures, well within my earnings. So I still do things and I have cash earnings in the world. But what I spend is really only about 20% of what I earn. And that's, I own my own home finally. I, you know, I own my vehicles. I don't owe anybody as far as I know, except Amex every month money. <laughs> yeah. Just because I, for obvious reasons, I use Amex. So it's, if get into under your means, then take the excess and start taking some risks. As with risk comes reward, I want you to be a risk taker but I don't want you to be risking your kid's next meal or your next month's rent. Let's get that stuff in line, get your earnings up, and then start to invest. There's, I, had, I get wacky ideas myself sometimes. And I'm like, I go to Alibaba and I find some product that I, I think, oh, this needs to be solved. And I go find a product. I'm like, holy smokes, it exists and nobody's talking about it. <laughs> and I buy the product and I go out there and quietly build a website and test it and launch something. And if it works, then I hire an individual to run that like a company and off it goes by itself. And nobody knows that I did it and it produces cash and it doesn't have to produce a ton of cash. It's just like, I like to see, Oh yeah, we got that widget working. Yeah. So I, I, I think what makes you unique is you love the game. Yeah. I like, I like to watch things grow. I like, you know, my friend over at the wizard Academy, Roy Williams says I'm a gambler. And I'm like, if you, if you saw how I actually behaved on a day-to-day -day basis, you, that's the last thing I am. I'm a gardener. I'm not a gambler. Oh, oh that. Ron, thank you so much. For, for the listeners who, who want to learn more about Mark, uh, uh, Mark Mercenary or just how to work with you, or how to get in touch, how can they find you? You know, the, actually now the easiest way is I have a website, um, uh, ronnielynch.com. And www.ronnielynch.com, R-O-N-N-Y-L-Y-N-C-H.com. And you can go there and get familiar with my writings. I have a mailing list that you can join. I don't hit the mailing list that often, but if you want to communicate with me, I, you know, I get messages inbound from there. Um, or you can, if you want to just uh, jump into a, a longer conversation about the course and hear about that, it's, I have it hosted on Gumroad uh, and you can go look up the marketing mercenary. Um, and if you want to learn more about me, just Google Ron Lynch marketing and there's plenty to be had. So Love it. We'll thank make you. Sure, we'll make sure to put it all in the show notes. Ron, always great chatting with you. It's My pleasure. So entirely. Smart. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Hey everyone. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you want, check out our most recent video over here. And this one is the one YouTube thinks you'll like, but if you really enjoyed watching, please do me a favor, like, and subscribe over here. Thank you so much.